This is The Dime, a 10-minute dive into the cannabis and hemp industry through trends, insights, predictions, and tangents. What's up, guys? Welcome back to The Dime. As always, I've got my right-hand man, Kellen Finney, and this week we've got two very special guests, pioneers in the space, Ken Snoke and Wes Burke from Emerald Scientific. Gentlemen, thanks for taking the time. How are you guys doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having us. Yeah, doing great. Thanks. Appreciate being here, you guys. I think this is a fantastic little show you guys are doing. I appreciate that. Uh, This week, we've got a unique topic, and we think the two of you are perfect to kind of bring us back to the beginning of the evolution of the cannabis industry. More specifically, before we get started, can each of you kind of take us through how you originally got started into the space and what your backgrounds are? Wes, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah, I'm. Um, I I came to cannabis from the the real estate industry, believe it or not. So I had been working as a, a real estate agent and broker for about twenty years, and I had the good fortune of being neighbors and really close friends with with Ken Snoke. And I came to learn over the years that Ken is a serial entrepreneur and has uh, built several successful companies. And I think he saw a little bit of that. Uh, entrepreneurship in in me, and he came to me with the idea in 2014, which I'll let him explain how he how he got there. But um, yeah, I, I have to credit um, my being in the industry to to Ken, and uh, I couldn't be more thrilled about it. It's been the absolute funnest ride of my entire life. Yeah, and from my standpoint, this is Ken. So I. I had a career in biotechnology, mostly basic research, but moved kind of in a couple different segments and managed to take a hiatus and and move to Oregon to try my hand at organic vegetable gardening, of all things, and farming. So I was trying to do some small farming and through that met uh, a handful of uh, cannabis growers at the time that were starting in the medical program in Oregon. And because of the background I have in science, um, you know, just started to have some ideas about how scientific products fit into the, you know, potentially to the cannabis industry. I mean, if you look at it from the standpoint of it being a, a, a partly, you know, medical industry, it's an agriculture industry, it's a commodity, it's a rec, you know, recreational substance, and all of those things, if you look at those independently, uh, rely heavily at some point throughout their life stage on um, contributions from science at different levels. And, um, when I looked at kind of looked around the industry back in 2013, there were some big challenges there because of the nature of the two industries. They didn't overlay very well, let's just say. And I think the reasons are obvious. Um, you know, the, the segmented, uh, market in cannabis, because every state doing things a little bit differently during the legalization rollout, as we continue to see today, really presented some challenges. Um, back then, the stigma still of uh, cannabis really presented some challenges, while I don't think that's so much an issue today. And it, it really created a, a scenario where it made sense to have a, a dedicated scientific supplier to the industry. And that's when uh, I went and chatted with Wes, and I guess the rest is history. Yeah, and I think that history has really made a huge marker on the industry. So can you explain a little bit to our listeners who are just unfamiliar with Emerald Scientific and and the unique value that it brings to the industry? Yeah, sure. Um, So we are a dedicated uh, scientific product distributor to the cannabis industry. Um, And, you know, I'll go back to my time in research. Oftentimes, um, we depended on our suppliers for technical support, helping us decide, you know, kind of uh, what areas we might pursue first based on product availability and um, a bunch of other factors. And so I, I think where Emerald Scientific really lines up, where we really bring value is our understanding of thousands and tens of thousands of scientific products and how they fit into different segments of the industry, whether it's in you know, cultivation or manufacturing and extraction, the quality assurance testing, research, all of those areas have uh, different components where they really depend on scientific products. So everything from um, instrumentation for measurement, you know, all of your scales and balances and microscopes, of course, all the benchtop equipment and instrumentation, but all of the consumable products too, which it, from a, it's a pretty broad category, but from a scientific products category, that can mean a very 
specific calibration standard that's a cocktail of compounds to help you calibrate an instrument, let's say for pesticide testing of cannabis or potency testing all the way through to test tubes and gloves and chemicals and solvents and things like that. So um, we started out and really targeting the, the quality assurance segment of the industry because back in 2014, that was really the, the segment that needed, I guess, our help the most, if you will. And so that was really where we specialized early on and we've moved into the other segments of the industry since. There's a, a little bit, if I can tag on, there's a little bit of a chicken and the egg uh, dilemma with, with being a scientific distributor. The, the vendors that you need to supply products uh, would like for distributors to have a customer base and a customer base would like for, for distributors to have product offerings. So it's a, it's a little challenging to, to break into uh, an industry as a distributor because of that. And we were lucky and got some really great counsel um, from some folks that had uh, experience in similar scenarios. And that, that counsel in particular was um, that the industry probably could really benefit from a proficiency test as well as potentially a scientific conference. And at the time in 2013 and 14, there just wasn't really a venue, a, a conference venue where high level science was, was the focus. Most of the conferences back then were a little more uh, consumer facing. And so we, we launched the Emerald Test and the Emerald Conference in 2014. And it did a lot, uh, not only to deliver mm -hmm. those much needed services to the industry, but it also did a lot to help us establish a brand and build those relationships with our initial customers as well as our, our initial vendors. Yeah. And I definitely want to expand on the Emerald Test, but I wanted to kind of ask one question before we dove in. What was the industry like in 2014? Obviously, here we are in 2021 and the industry's made massive, massive advancements and we're still nowhere near where we need to be as a federal um, level. But what was it like in, in 2014? Can you kind of shed some, some light on what that experience was like? Ken, go ahead. I'd love to hear your perspective on that. <laughs> Um, yeah, trying to remember, you know, it's, it's been such a whirlwind. It doesn't feel like seven years to me as far as time goes, but certainly as far as industry progress, I think it feels like 20. And so, um, it was a really different environment, you know, then, uh, the, the nascency of the industry was such that, um, so many of the pioneers, I think that our industry probably doesn't give enough credit to that that we're active during the black market. And, you know, whatever our our the um perception is or our opinions about the the illicit market and the market before it was legal uh, are back in those days, you know, there was a lot of talk about the gray market. And this was this gray area between what was legal and what wasn't. I mean you know, we were still in a time back then when anybody in the industry that was abiding by the the rules of the medical program in their state could at any time be busted, you know, by feds or the state. I mean, you just never knew what you were going to get into. And so that there was this, you know, this uh, real challenge to begin working in the industry. And, you know, even for us, we're a few steps removed from the plant. And still, we do have compounds, you know, for like the calibration standards I was talking about that do contain cannabinoids and things like that. So it, it felt really risky still at the time. You know, it just felt like we might just go out there and work for a few years and have everything taken away from us. And that's one big difference between back then and at least today. I just I feel like there's there is enough momentum now that at least I don't have, I don't wake up in the middle of the night thinking that something's going to happen that's just going to end everything. And maybe that's still a little bit naive. I don't know. I hope not. Yeah. And I, I think we've watched science evolve at a pace that's not, not normal for other industries either. I mean, back in 2014, some of the labs that we were working with were op operated out of folks' garages. And it's certainly a different climate than, than that now. And I think as we, you know, as we look back at the content uh, of the Emerald Conference over the, the last six or seven years, I mean, we, we went from kind of Science 101 to a, a much, much deeper level. And, and I think that 
that's uh, that's one of the funnest things for me to watch is just how fast this industry has has matured. Yeah, the Emerald Conference is uh, one of my favorite events of the year. Obviously, going to San Diego is nice, and it's right around this beautiful time too. So it's a it's a shame that we're not all there now. And the the depth of the science at these conferences are just mind blowing. Um, Kel and I have a couple of experiences. We'd be in the back listening to the speakers and then just be mind blown about kind of the depths and the understanding of some of the data that's being presented. And it's it's pretty insane. So, Kellen, do you have any uh, concepts of a favorite stories of Emerald Scientific or maybe kind of dive us into the conversation about the Emerald test? I became familiar with the with Emerald Scientific specifically as a vendor when I was operating up in up in Humboldt and I went down to the Emerald Conference and I think it was the third annual conference and being from traditional academia, I think Wes said it just perfectly. There was absolutely nothing out there from a scientific content perspective. And so it was such a breath of fresh air going into that conference and seeing all these really professional individuals doing real science and um, unbelievable science. And there were some really cool studies in particular regarding uh, methyl jasminate and how it increases terpene production. That uh, is one particular uh, talk that I listened to. And um, it was really cool because I went back to, to Humboldt and I was talking to a grower and I was like, oh no, like you should try this chemical. They couldn't get it anywhere else. I literally called up Emerald and Emerald was like, oh yeah, no, perfect. Like this is the cast number you want. This is exactly the the concentration you want. And they were able to execute on that order. And that was since then, I've just been a huge, huge Emerald fan. So <laughs> that's kind of my my Emerald story as it as it sits. That's great to hear, Kellen. Thanks for telling that. <laughs> yeah, no worries. So from a research standpoint, obviously from where we started in 2014 and where we are now, we've come a long way. Where do you guys see the biggest need for an investment from a research standpoint? And, and what do you think that looks like from a time frame perspective? Um, yeah, so research is really interesting. You know, if we look at research, there's there's different levels, right? So we might think of um, within the quality assurance setting. So the third party testing labs, they might perform some research to uh, figure out better methods for testing, for example. So there's, you know, that kind of uh, ongoing research. There's, you know, uh, uh, at the at the cultivation level, there's always research going on, right? So cultivators are constantly modifying scenarios, looking at, at different ways for production. Um, one of the things that when when you kind of look at more of the the pharmaceutical model. So cannabis is interesting on the medical side because it's it's both a medicine and a pharmaceutical, and those are those are different things largely. Um, medicines can be, you know, natural supplements. They can be all sorts of things. They they can have some support by data of clinical studies, or they may not have a lot of support. I think as a medicine, cannabis has a fair amount of data now from clinical studies, both formal and informal. Um, and, and we're learning a ton from those studies. When I think of the, the pharmaceutical model that really looks at this very basic research in the preclinical setting where compounds are put through usually cellular models, looking at at responses from cell lines that have an, uh, have, uh, you know, a uh, uh, an importance in a particular disease, let's say. So you might have a, a cell line that uh, has a response that you've grown up that mimics a certain type of cancer or a certain type of autoimmunity or something like that. And you can start to look at the way compounds um, impact the behavior of these cells. So these are very early research models in the, in the clinical pathway. And then beyond that, you enter into the, you know, the phase one, two, and three clinical trials of, of compounds that are going through this pharmaceutical pathway. And I think that's an area where particularly the preclinical studies are, are really going to change over the next few years. And it's one that um, any type of federal rescheduling could have a dramatic impact on. The availability of the compounds for research is incredibly challenging when they're schedule one. Let's talk about Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. That's right. No more excuses. Get your lazy ass off the couch. Go start a podcast. There's the creation tool that allows you to record, 
and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Once again, no more excuses. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. Could it be easier? Even better, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. That's right. They're paying us for this ad. Thank you very much, Anchor. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started now. So how does one go about making sure that the chemicals in these preclinical trials are of the highest quality? Is there a specific uh, means that exists right now for kind of uh, making sure that they meet a specific quality? Not much. I mean, and that's one of the areas where Emerald is really moving into is starting to create cannabinoids and terpenoids and different compounds in different formulations that are compatible for preclinical research. So that and those are very different than the formulations that are necessary for those for quality assurance work, for example. Um, And so we're going to be releasing soon in the next several months our initial product line for the preclinical research market. We're really excited about it. I think it can really um, help the the research segment to to really start to look at some of these compounds and their preclinical models. And it's it's interesting this this plant kind of rep, it brings to to bear this nuance that I think is different from much of the medical or pharmaceutical research in the past, where you you may have a you know e- even if it's plant derived, you you start out with a handful of compounds mm. of interests. And so the, you know, the research is usually fairly limited to those compounds, but cannabis uh, is a different animal. I mean, there's hundreds of cannabinoids, uh, hundreds of terpenes. We're starting to, to, to contemplate the impact of flavonoids. So really there's um, so much potential for research based on that unique characteristic of this plant. Yeah, and I think, Ken, you said it perfect. I think it was two years ago at the Emerald Scientific Conference after three days and closing out the conference, you came up and said, it seems like we know nothing. And that, I think, was so eye-opening for me to, to hear that even after all these studies and all these advancements, we're still in like the bottom of the first in understanding from a scientific standpoint, like where we are with the cannabinoids and how it can really work with the human body. Kellen, what's your thoughts from an educational standpoint and a research standpoint of the direction of the industry? I mean, I think preclinical work as well as kind of just the basic science that um, is the foundation for these more advanced studies that we're used to hearing about in in your traditional pharmaceutical world, right? Um, I mean, when I started, you couldn't look up the boiling point of THC, right? So we've come a a really, really long way in the last five years, but with the lack of funding to our traditional institutes um, because of its federal scheduling right now, um, it's just, we don't have that robust foundation where you have all of these institutes, colleges and universities that are federally funded that are providing and pumping out the, the groundwork to base a lot of the more complex studies to gain a deeper understanding of how these cannabinoids are interacting with the endocannabinoid system. I mean, we're still not exactly sure the, the binding affinities and all of those for these G coupled CB1 and CB2 proteins right now. And so the, the fundamentals are absolutely more important than ever right now to be able to build on. Cause right now we're trying to build the second floor of this house and no, we haven't even poured the concrete yet. Yeah. Interesting. That's a great, (laughs) great way to look at it. So let's dive into a listener question. What do you think is the biggest issue or hindrance for the current state of the cannabis industry? Can be anything. Wes, we can start with you. Well, I mean, I I think I'll state the obvious. You can call me Captain Obvious after this, but I I think the lack of of a federal legal framework and a federal regulatory framework, it's really the the giant impediment. I mean, when when Kellen talks about the you know the organizations that are typically well funded for research, that's that's very challenging in in this legal framework or lack of a legal framework. And I, I think once we see some some changes. On the federal front, from a from a legal standpoint, even if it is descheduling or rescheduling, I think the the gate the floodgates are going to come wide open, and we're going to start to really see uh, another boom in the evolution of science in the industry. Yeah, one thing I I would add to that that I I don't hear talked about frequently is um, the notion that that framework 
might need to be very different for the medical path versus the rec path. You know, right now we get everything kind of held under one roof. And if you look at other scenarios, those are incredibly different uh, pathways, you know, from a regulatory standpoint. And I think looking at um, really the the medical piece, you know, and, and thinking about what kind of federal oversight is really useful for us to move that forward is is really important. And then also considering the the recreational use path, that's probably a really different framework. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a very personal example. I have a, a daughter that that has benefited from, she's got a chronic, a chronic disease and she benefits from cannabinoid compounds. Um, the consideration for me as a 55 year old guy using cannabis recreationally is incredibly different and should have a different level of oversight than a 14 year old girl. You know, if I, let's be frank, I can, I can handle some pesticides at my age. They're probably, you know, not going to have a huge impact on me. A daily consumption of pesticides on a developing brain is a very different heavy metals, same thing, you know, all these contaminants we think about, that's a very, very different scenario than, than the rec path. So um, it's one of the things that I think is a, is a really big challenge today is considering how to break out these different components of the industry. I think that's, I mean, uh, very well said. I mean, there's a, a massive difference between the quality of um, product that comes out of a uh, $20 million pharmaceutical facility versus the quality of product that comes out of a, a million dollar uh, facility in a garage. You know what I mean? Um, it's just that kind of money and that kind of science buys you a much, much more, a much purer compound. And the, I mean, that's why pharmaceuticals are where they are. And you know exactly what that individual is, is ingesting and putting in their body versus some of these unknowns associated with uh, lower quality products. Yeah, so I, I completely think, agree. I think what's interesting is maybe in cannabis, or I believe there's a there is a place for both of those. You know, I, and I don't think that's always the case, right? So, um, for certain compounds, I'd say no. They probably only deserve or, or should only be down the pharmaceutical path. And I'm I'm not hoping that or wishing that for for cannabis as an industry. I don't want to force everything down a pharmaceutical pathway. I think it it has plenty of, um, of its own challenges and faults for sure. So, um, I agree with you, Kellen. And I, I, I think those, the, the, the neat thing about where we are is there can be a place for both of those. Yeah. Yeah. The, in, the, in, the industry is just in its infancy stage. And I think it starts with education. It can start all the way through from the scientists, all the way back down to the consumers. I think we as a society can do a better job being just educated. And I think that takes some time. So I think, over the next couple of months, hopefully we'll start accelerating and, and these types of advancements will, will pick up and we'll start to lay the groundwork like we all stated here to, to really start to understand the nuances of the plant. Yeah, another, if I can throw in, another real challenge are sampling schemes on the scientific testing part. You know, we, we go through a lot of work to really dial in uh, so much of our testing and it continues to be an area, but in other industries, a lot of attention has been placed on exactly where along the supply chain do you test, you know, how much do you take as a sample size? And those really have an impact on how the ultimate data that you generate from quality assurance testing, um, it, it really impacts the relevance of that data. You know, how you make heads and tails of it and what you do with it is is really sometimes based on the sampling schemes. And I Unless things have changed in the last couple of weeks, I think it's still a really big hole um, in our industry. Where do you want to see that going? I think it just comes down to sampling schemes. It's statistics. It's data and statistics, you know, and it's really um, about who is going to put up the money for doing those kinds of studies. And I'm not always a huge fan of federal oversight. I don't want to... to 
lead anybody down that path, but I really believe in the quality assurance scenario and in the research scenario, there are really important places where federal oversight can help. And I think these sampling schemes are often presented by, you know, the USDA or the FDA or something like that. And that's an area right out of the gate that I would hope that they would could really uh, assist the industry. You know, I'd love to believe that these agencies will take a step back and really see where these holes are. You know, see where they can move the industry forward. <laughs> Am I? Is it a pipe dream? <laughs> it's a good hope. It's right? the, the so slow. Good. Yeah. So let's hop into prediction time. Over the next year, what advancements do you believe we accomplish from an industry-wide standpoint? And that can be wherever you want to take that. Wes, do you want to start? Yeah, I think I, I'm going to predict that we see um, the banking issue resolved by by the end of the year. And I think that that is going to um, allow access to institutional money. And I think we're going to see another boom in the industry. And, and I think that will spill over um, into the sciences and the, the life sciences and the research and development. I second that. I, I agree completely, Wes. I, I think we have a tendency to talk about federal legalization like it's a single stroke sometimes. And we're going to look back years from now and realize that it was a whole series of events. And I think the the banking piece is it, we might just look back and say that that was the most important step. I think rescheduling or descheduling is another one that's coming, but I'm not going to go so far as to say that in the next year, but I think the Safe Banking Act and other uh, banking regulations could be hugely impactful. Yeah, I completely agree with with both of you guys. Um, I think the banking will get resolved. Um, there's just a bunch of institutional investors jumping in now on their own merit, and I think it's it's the next domino to fall. And I think the science space will probably be the largest to benefit from, from that because they're going to want to know what they're getting themselves into. And the best way to do that is just to fund, fund that research, you know? Yeah. Who's training this next generation of scientists though, as the industry is exploding, the job market is just booming, right? And, and all these operators who are scaling as fast as possible are looking to put these qualified individuals into spaces across the United States. At a certain point, we're not going to have enough qualified individuals. So I think universities are going to have to accelerate the training program. Maybe the MSOs kind of develop this out, or maybe there's a third party that starts educating these operators to kind of transition to these roles because the expectations is just there's going to be too much too much demand and not enough supply so i just i don't know what they're going to do about that well you guys have to realize that um organizations like eighth revolution and information channels like the dime podcast i mean you guys are are seniors in the industry now and you're the ones that are taking the reins and uh, and taking responsibility for sharing and spreading that information. So I, I think it's you guys. Keep it up. I well, appreciate that. We'll definitely have to take that in. So before we wrap, we ask all of our guests, when was the last time you consumed any cannabinoid product? Ken? Last night. Quest? Today. There it is. Thanks, guys, so much. We appreciate it. And where can everyone find you guys if they're interested in getting in touch? Do you have social handles? If not, do you have some sort of company uh, profiles you could shout out? Yeah, I mean, emeraldscientific.com is is kind of the, the hub for Emerald Scientific. There's, you know, the emeraldtest.com. There's the emeraldconference.com. We're all over social media. We're not that hard to find. Just uh, Google Emerald Scientific and you won't have any trouble finding us. Yeah, we'll link you up in the, the show notes so everyone can find you guys and ask you any questions of what it was like in 2014. Thanks so much for your time, guys. We appreciate it. Thanks for Thank having you us. very much.